Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Brunet Jailly, and I am um, the host for this um, uh, seminar um, held uh, from the University of Victoria uh, in British Columbia. Um, and I would like to uh, start with the territory acknowledgement. We acknowledge with respect the Lankwangwen people on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands and the Songhees, Esquamo, and Wasanich people whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. And although um, I am not at the University of Victoria, I would like to also acknowledge that I am speaking from the unceded, unceded Songhees land. Um, and today we have a great talk uh, by Charlotte Chaillet. Let me tell you very briefly uh, about Charlotte. She did a PhD uh, at University of British Columbia, and she has teaching interest in the post-1945 uh, uh, diasporic and transcultural writings and memory studies. Uh, so she studies Jewish identity, she studies the Holocaust, and she's been teaching about the Holocaust. Um, and today she is uh, going to present to us her most uh, recent uh, research. Um, um, maybe just before I give the floor to Charlotte, I would like to add one thing is that she published with Agnes Hirschi um, a book on the Swiss Vice Council Karl Lutz, which I have read and that I would like to recommend to everybody. It's a fabulous story about a Swiss vice council who helps people escape from um, a factory. Um, and I just thought the story was amazing. It's, uh, it's, it's um, similar to the movie, uh, The Schind Schindler's List, but um, you know, in a very different context. And it's a, it's a very, um, uh, 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 it's it's a very it's a it's a story that made me cry. So I think everybody should read the book. Uh, Charlotte, on these nice words, I give you the floor. I'm delighted to have you in our seminar series. Thank you so very much to have accepted uh, to come to talk to us today. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you so much for this invitation, and thank you everybody for attending. It's a real privilege to be here. So I'm doing the um, square. Let's share screen function, one second. Just have to make sure. Can you see it? Nodding? Okay, great. So thanks, thank you again for having me today. So I would like to approach today's topic, graphic novels, Holocaust memory and human rights from several angles, raising the following questions. Why should we situate the history of the Holocaust within the framework of human rights and civic education? What does teaching and learning about for and within the framework of human rights entail? What does reading comics through the lens of human rights accomplish? And why are graphic narratives such a suitable medium to convey human rights and social justice topics? In the second part of the presentation, I will introduce, as Emmanuel already said, our trauma-informed community-engaged project as an example of how we can incorporate human rights themed practices into our own work as scholars and Holocaust educators. Our two central areas of inquiry are, what are the best human rights focused practices for collecting, preserving and teaching the lived experiences of Holocaust survivors? And how can sites of traumatic history and memory be transformed into the visual storytelling medium? So learning about and for human rights and Holocaust education contributes to a critical engagement with social justice. It teaches students to respect and defend, I'm quoting Hannah Arendt, the right to have rights. However, learning about the Holocaust in a human rights context is not necessarily standard and common practice in Israel, Germany, and Canada. So the Shoah is a central part in the Israeli high school curriculum. However, there's rarely a direct link between teaching the Holocaust and, and applying a human rights framework. 
Now, Germany, of course, has an extensive Holocaust education curriculum, yet only few teacher training programs offer graduate seminars in Holocaust learning and human rights education, bringing these two approaches together. And in Canada, we are still also in the early stages of developing joint initiatives between universities, Holocaust practitioners and human rights groups. And here I would like to say that our program in Holocaust studies is, is the definitely with Helga Torsen, Kristen Simmons, teaching at the forefront of bringing in community engaged research. Here I found another beautiful project uh, that was, uh, was done in, in Montreal called Refugee Boulevard. So reading through the lens of human rights is as uh, Pramod Nayar argues, um, the human rights perspective is a form of reading text that constitutes activist scholarship and contributes consequently to human rights cultures and human rights practices. Why do graphic novels, visual narrative work so well when we deal with very difficult and violent histories? Um, again, I'm quoting uh, Pramod Naya, the graphic novel is a preeminent form to thematize human rights concerns with its ability to merge text and image, force a critical literacy upon the reader, enable a visibilization of the act and politics of witnessing capture trauma and body violence generate empathetic and effective connections. And we'll talk more about that because that's very much what we try to accomplish in our project as well. That, that, we, that we inject the interviewer into the story itself, thus foregrounding the actual testimony collection and receiving process. Now, Monique Eichmann, a scholar in Lausanne, Switzerland, reminds us that there are considerable challenges when we interlink Holocaust and human rights education. She asks a question, is Holocaust education a tool for teaching about human rights? Should it be or can it be? And she proposes three approaches that are to a large extent intertwined. We can talk about uh, learning about, learning for, and within the framework of human rights. And although they work together, they not necessarily have the same learning outcomes. So what does learning about human rights mean? Have we gained knowledge about the history of human rights and institutional dimensions of the UN Human Rights Council? What does learning for human rights entail? Uh, it advances the development of competencies to act, advocacy work, recognizing human rights violations, learning to protect and establish these rights. And lastly, learning within a framework of human rights um, focuses our attention to the learning process and the learning conditions and how they are framed by human rights consideration. And of course, the whole educational process itself guarantees respect for human rights. So the question is, how can we bring in these three uh, concerns into the Holocaust studies, into the Holocaust education classroom? So what I oftentimes do when I teach about uh, human rights in the context of Holocaust education, I start with uh, raising awareness to the impact of the Holocaust on modern human rights law. I mentioned that 1945, the modern international law of human rights begins with the Charter of the United Nations and 1946 genocide was recognized as an international crime by the United Nations General Assembly. When I teach human rights in the context of Holocaust education, I start very much with an emphasis on, on the hundreds of legal restrictions in Germany that were imposed upon Jews and other groups. Consequently, Jews lost their political, legal, and civil rights and became completely segregated within German society. So Jews in Germany had no internationally guaranteed human rights. It's important to stress that, that after the introduction of the Nuremberg laws, there was no longer any legal framework in place to protect them. And raising this particular issue, of course, allows us then very much to interlink the question of the loss of human rights to cont contemporary uh, human rights violations. Now, learning for human rights in the context of Holocaust education provides students with an appropriate context to develop a human rights ethos, 
acquire skill sets appropriate to democratic participation, and learn how to combine academic knowledge of what is taking place in the world with the ability to affect change. So what we envision is to have the, from the teaching of the Holocaust to contemporary uh, human rights, genocide, prevention uh, approach, which, which is of course, as Monique Ekman reminded us, in theory um, possible, but oftentimes in practice, very difficult to up, up, up achieve. Now, what does learning within a framework of human rights in the context of Holocaust education entail? Human rights-based approaches include participatory pedagogies, active learning, student-centered learning, educating through human rights is also a call to teach diversity of perspectives, reading about and from those demanding rights exposes students to non-dominant voices. Thus, by organizing a syllabus to be inclusive and teach non-dominant perspectives, and by sustaining a classroom based on diversity of thought and opinion, faculty can model what it means to live by human rights. And this quote is from Sarita Cargas. Now, when we speak about uh, graphic novels, I think it's important to stress that these are not just fictitious pieces of works, novel, this is not a genre, but is this a medium? Huh? So not graphic novels can be many things. They can be history, fantasy, fiction, they can be um, scholarly, journalistic. So again, I, I started using the, the term narrative just to avoid um, uh, the confusion with the term novel, there can be memoirs and so forth. So graphic novels are similar to comic books because they use sequential art to tell a story. However, unlike comics, graphic novels are generally standalone stories with much more complex plots. Again, why are graphic novels so ideally suited for us to deal with very difficult subject matters? Quoting Charles Aikson, he writes, the medium generates reader engagement by demanding direct interaction with the narrative to make full meaning of the various page elements. And of course, you have visuals, you have text, you have um, oftentimes indication of sounds, and you have gutters, you have en empty spaces. So it's almost very difficult to consume a graphic novel or graphic narrative passively. And now here I'm quoting Barbara Yelin, who is one of our participating artists and project participants. So she described it very beautifully. So she says, generally speaking, comics and graphic novels are a narrative format that is very good at engaging readers. Reading a work that combines pictures, dialogue, narrative texts, and informational texts that have to be linked together in readers' minds requires them to make an active contribution to the process. It is almost, I think of it watching a, a movie, but then just slowing it down and watching it in stills. And so here, by the way, is, is an excerpt from her grad a graphic narrative that she's co-producing together with Holocaust survivor Emmy R. Bell. And I'll talk more about the process later on. So continue quoting um, Barbara Yelin showing um, some drawings from, from Gilad Selektar, who also uh, participates in the project. So Barbara writes, not only does the act of reading get the reader acquainted with the story at best, it also has an unsettling effect that reverberates in the reader and prompts him or her to embark on a process of inner reflection and explore new questions. And, and particularly with an approach where we have a human rights theme approach, where we bring in the artist as well, the interviewer, it's that additional level of engagement that is always very much foregrounded in these graphic narratives as well. Quoting here Rosenblatt and Lansford, comics are unmatched in their ability to combine words, images, and sounds to create immediacy, to take the reader directly into the scene, and action through mixing image and text, while also being obviously enough an artificial language, meaning they create a distortion in German of a Fremdungs effect of panels, figures, speech balloons, and more that we are encouraged to stop and reflect on our experience in ways that film, for instance, may not always demand. 
And if you take graphic novels into the classroom and you have um, work student groups just slowly analyze each panel, you can really spend an entire teaching unit just looking at, at one panel and start analyzing each drawing, the composition of it. And, and here, for example, is I uh, used a, a page from Brutu Modan's uh, most recent work, Tunnels. Uh, you can look at, at, at so many so many elements, particularly of what is said and what is not said. And that's another very important aspect I will talk about later. Um, I think graphic novels are extremely well suited in also giving voice for memories that are no longer accessible, that are buried, that are deeply traumatic. And that brings us then to life stories and memories of child survivors. So visual storytelling in graphic narratives is especially effective for life stories and memories of child survivors as, as these survivors recall their memories in a vivid associative context, which intuitively lends itself to visual representation. Oftentimes a child survivor will not have a comprehensive um, coherent chronological narrative, but will have flashbacks, will have visuals that come back. So it's often an extremely fragmented memory recollection uh, process. And here I'm quoting Julius Maslowat himself, a child survivor. Uh, so images are deeply imprinted in a child survivor's memory. Julius Maslowat eloquently describes this process of memory recall as predominantly visually driven. The image is the actual language. Now, human rights themed graphic novels oftentimes foreground testimonials and counters, injecting the interviewer in the narrative of the actual story. So they don't hide the fact, like in a traditional uh, testimony, where we, as interviewers, almost withdraw. And, and the audiovisual testimony will solely focus on the survivor. A testimonial encounters in, in human rights and trauma informed graphic novels will very much foreground and problematize the role of the person that collects the testimony, which, which is a challenge, but is, is, a, is a tremendous um, tool for us to actually draw attention to, 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 to the relational and the interrelational uh, co-production of memory that is that is taking place because nobody remembers it by themselves. Nobody remembers in a vacuum. We always remember together with another human being. And it is this 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 encounter, this dialogue, this conversation really that that generates memory. And 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 through this process, I think we can very much uh, draw draw light and uh, illuminate the construction of memory. So through em empathetic listening, the storyteller, in this case, the interviewer, forms a relational connection to the interviewee. Those whose stories are being told and visualized are not objects of study, but are actors in their own history. That's very important to remember. And here's the human rights approach. Their voice is fully integrated, is fully heard, is, is not objectified. Then experiences are, are not objectified as well. Both the interviewer and the interview are implicated in the co-production of history and, and memory. And it is important that the interview, as I said, is not in a way cut out, edited out in the process because the interviewer, the way they ask questions, even their presence itself will, will have a huge impact on how the, the, the testimony is being shared. So I would argue that our narrative and visual storytelling project is conceived at a critical juncture in Holocaust education, the recent surge of nationalist right-wing threats to democracy, I would add to Holocaust it's education itself, xenophobia, racism, and anti-Semitism in Europe and North America compels us to foster new pathways of interdisciplinary and community engaged dialogue in human rights focused Holocaust teaching and learning. And now here I wanna talk about our, our project for which we were fortunate to receive funding um, from SHIRK and um, the project includes um, partners from Canada, Germany, Israel, Netherlands and the US. Uh, many community partners, um, archives, and it also includes, of course, center stage, most importantly, the survivors and the artists. So our graphic novelist are Barbara Yelin, who's based in Germany, Miriam Libicki, based in Vancouver, but this year living in France, and Gilad Selikta, 
who lives in, in Israel and they work in close collaboration with the survivors and are the co-producers of this graphic art. Now, I should say I didn't know any of these artists. We, um, I, just, um, called, I just contacted them out of the blue. And I was very lucky that, that they answered and, and then recommended other artists. So this really has, has been a very community engaged process, even putting this project to, to, together. So their works then, the works that we produce as part of this project will be accompanied by teacher's guides and instructional materials in, several, in the languages of the participating countries. We will produce individual lessons plan, which will be adapted to uh, culturally specific learning environments and learning standards in the participating countries. Now our participating witness survivors are Amy R. Bell, was born 1937 in The Hague, uh, David Schaffer, born 1939 in, in Bukovina, Romania, and the Kamp brothers, Rolf and Nico Kamp, who were born in Krefeld and survived in Holland in 13 different hiding places. So again, the, the core question that is driving our research is what are the best human rights focused practices for collecting, preserving, and teaching the lived experiences of Holocaust survivors, and how can sites of traumatic history and memory be transformed into a visual storytelling medium. Um, so our new arts-based approach to testimony inquiry intru introduces new pathways for engaging with survivors' testimonies, a new trauma-informed pedagogy in Holocaust and human rights education. And also, as I, as I pointed out, this is, not a pro this is not a project that can be accomplished by a single individual. It is very much a collaborative project, a project that, that in its conception as well is very much focused on, on relational knowledge production from learning with one another, working through issues, conflicts uh, with one another, and so this is really a community of, of scholars, community practitioner, artists, and survivors with a deep respect for one another. And, and again, oftentimes there is a project lead, but it really is, is a truly collab collaborative project. And, and the aim is, and this is now what we haven't started that yet, it starts in, the, in, in actually next month, it design, design of impactful teaching resources that integrate learning about the Shoah into broader questions of human rights protection. I've also started to collect material on the processes that we gather in terms of working with one another. And I also like to uh, put together a toolkit for other scholars, community practitioners who are interested in pursuing similar projects, beats with artists, with other forms of art, theater, film, or, or literature, because I, I find we learning so, so much through this process that, that making these toolkits available could be a really um, beautiful learning outcome as well. So as those of you in attendance who've been, have been collecting eyewitness testimonies know you're familiar with that the genre of video testimony is very monologic in nature. I'm quoting Hank Greenspan here as, as the interpersonal center of the gravity is almost always represented in the survivor and not in the relationship between the survivor and the interviewer. And so this whole dialogic process oftentimes is completely erased as if it didn't exist, although it's at the heart of the relationship and at the heart of each testimony collection process. I would even argue that it would be absolutely impossible for a survivor to go back to deeply traumatic memories on their own without having the support, having the trust-based relationship uh, to, to a listener. It, it's, it, it would be very difficult. And here I would like to say or, or quote what Ilona Schulman Spar said, it, it, these are all trust-based relationships that, that, that grow over months, over years. It's something that really cannot be organized. It's something that, that de develops over, over longer time. Now we approach witness survivor testimony beyond a regimented set of interview protocols. We conceptualize arts-based testimony inquiries as interactive reciprocal processes committing ourselves to self-reflexively examine our own research practices and we adhere to the concept of shared authority so we are mindful to engage with survivors as partners in research and not as objects 
of research. And this process itself is, is um, slower than conventional interviews, which, which I've, I've conducted too, which, which have a time limit, can be collected relatively quickly. Uh, this process here is because it's very collaborative and oftentimes engages family members, lots of feedback, um, sometimes disagreements, sometimes a bit of conflict. And so because it's like any relationship as it grows, it's, it needs to be ne ne negotiated. So again, I love to quote Henry Greenspan. So he describes the joint knowledge production process as knowing with survivors as compared with knowing from or about them. And, and of course we are in this phase where we have very few survivors who are still with us in this mostly child survivors. And even here, we do have challenges of, of um, uh, uh, dementia, maybe of, of having difficulties remembering. And this is something which we would in our, in our approach not deny, but we would integrate it as well into the testimony uh, collection process. So here I wanted to briefly introduce to you our three teams. Miriam Lebicki and the David Schaffer um, have been working together and I'd like to um, show you a brief clip that has been uh, produced by, by Jerome Kim, who was a former student, has worked for European studies as well, and it gives you just a very short vignette of their relationship and, and you can see that uh, David Schaffer very much makes the case how important it is for him to share the story that he doesn't want it to be forgotten. And for him, the learning for human rights is absolutely at the forefront. And I think that is probably the case for all, um, all um, child survivors that are actively engaged in speaker bureaus and, and speak to young kids. They really very much are human rights activists in their own right. So I'm going to play that. Oops, hold on. Can, can you see it or is it dark? Amanda? It's very dark. Yeah. Hold on, I'm not sure why. Hmm. Do you know, Mike, why it might be so dark? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. Your brightness is up high, so. Um... Can, I, can I maybe show it not on screen sharing mode? Would that work? No, you have to screen share, but if you have the video separate, you could play the video separately, like wherever you might have it. Not I have it here. Present. I have it here. Yeah. yeah. If you want to try it that way, that might work. I'm so sorry. Can you see it? Yeah, that's much better. Can you hear it? Yeah, it works perfectly. Welcome. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. Good to see you again. To me, the most important thing is to share the story with the general population so they realized what happened and to avoid it happening again. I'd really like to uh, do justice to uh, David's your great storytelling ability oh, and you. your very visual and sensory details. This is just a small teaser. Now we can try to get back to. I hope it works better with the other two. Whoops, there we go. So uh, our other team is um, Rolf and Nico Kam in Amsterdam. They work together with uh, Israeli-based uh, graphic novelist Gilad Selikta. And Gilad very much puts himself into the story and in the construction of the story. And um, you can see here we, um, we went together with a team of the Anne Frank House and with Nico and Rolf Kamp 
to their to the brothers um, home in that was in um, Amersfoort in the Dutch countryside and later we went to Achterfeld and this was filmed in front of their last hiding place um, as I said the, the two brothers took care of each other the 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 parents separated from them. Uh, the, the mother was deported, the, the father as well. The father was killed, the mother survived, but the two very young boys survived in hiding. And this was the house, this was the last house they were, they were hiding. And I just wanna see if we can show this. Also very short. Shalom. Shalom. It's so weird that everything, everything changed but the trees. But they were shooting all night and they were throwing landmines, three, no, three hand grenades into Inside. the... Yeah. And Gilad called it 13 secrets because the boys, of course, had to keep everything a secret and were not allowed to, to share that with anybody. And here you see two page drawings where Gilad himself did not just put himself into it, but the whole film team that, that also was, was around and was uh, following them around on two days. And again, here, um, shots from when we were in the car and later on the two boys um, that were, um, it's, it's quite a moving story, we relied, relied very much on, on each other for survival. And of course, those uh, Gentile families who were able to, to hide and protect them in the countryside. Now, what makes these narratives so interesting, and that, that will be the same with Barbara Yelins and Barbara and Amy Abel's story as well, as they move back and forth between the here and, and the now, and then you can really get, get this tension between the memory recollection process. And it's not smooth and it's not uh, chronological. And in this case, the two brothers disagree sometimes on the memory or remember it quite differently. And so for Gilad, it's important to include all of these processes as well. Now for the last part, I wanted to talk about Barbara, uh, Barbara Yelin's work with Emmy Armbell. Some of you are familiar with, with, with that particular project already. So Emmy Arbell was born 1937 in The Hague, Holland, and together with her family, she was deported to Ravensbrück. Um, Emmy, her mother and brother then were transferred to Bergen-Belsen, where she was liberated. So she was a very young child. And one week after liberation, Emmy had to witness how her mother was, was dying of, of exhaustion, starvation. And Emmy then later, 1948, immigrated to, to Israel. She had three daughters. One daughter passed away. And, we, and, and again, she's a human rights activist. She volunteers to support the children of Palestinian families from the West Bank. It is a very important impetus for her to uh, to participate in this project. She has not done it earlier. She just started uh, more recently through the Ravensbrück Generationen uh, Forum. Um, so in her sustained testimony collection work with Dutch born um, Holocaust child survivor, Amy Abel, uh, uh, Barbara Yelin creates a deeply fragmented narrative and visual language undercutting any attempts to impose a discernible storyline or plot structure. The joint testimony sharing collection sessions took place between February 2020 and March 22, both in person and on Zoom. And they are also repeatedly stymied by Emmy's inability to remember. So yet Barbara foregrounds Nicht-Erinnerung, so the act of non-remembering, not as a failure to recall the past, but as an important expression of traumatic memory work. Whereas traditional life story narration attempts to fill in the blanks, 
make up for, for uh, content that we no longer know, uh, Yelin, Barbara Yelin visualizes and complicates a survivor testimony that counteracts meaning making to the ongoing process of, of memory erasure. So Amy Arbel's response to Barbara Yelin's question and creates considerable challenges for the artist as Emmy sometimes pushes back against the telling of her own testimonies. And at the same time, Barbara Yelin is tasked to rely on visual material that is mediated through perpetrator photography from two sides of mass killings, Ravensbrück and Bergen-Belsen. Again, the memory mediation process is front front and center in this graphic novel. Uh, Barbara uh, describes it well. How do I draw the memories of the child? Emery, uh, Emmy, memory is not fixed. It's flooring. It's a changeable fabric. Em Emmy very often says, I don't remember. Uh, and so when describing the process, Barbara said, uh, writes, the present collides with the past. Memory has no chronological order. What she, what Emmy recalls, though, appears next to the dark passages. They are more, even more impressive, stark, and meaningful. Separate strands are braided into a single weave of images. Some panels throughout her story remain black because memory is black. And we see that in the graphic novel, often there's just no memory. So the whole panel remains empty. Here again, I wanna show a very short clip where Barbara very self-reflectively describes this process. When they brought us to Ravensbrück, we had to take off our clothes. And then I saw that they shaved our hair and I tried to escape. Sometimes I feel that, uh, was I there? Did this happen to me? Yeah. Could I live? After those things, uh, I sometimes I think no, it can't be. Ich bin Barbara Jelin. Ich erzähle Geschichten in Bildern. Ich zeichne eine Biografie über die 84-jährige Holocaust-Überlebende Emmy Abel. Wie zeige ich die Erinnerung des Kindes Emmy? Erinnerung ist nichts Festes. Sie ist ein fluides, wandelbares Gewebe. Das Zeichnen ist für mich ein Instrument des Erforschens. Wenn ich zeichne, ist jeder Strich eine Entscheidung und jede Linie stellt neue Fragen. Wie kann ein Kind sein in diesen Umständen? So here, Barbara really mentions something that is absolutely critical um, to any art-based approach, particularly with very traumatic memories. So we did not include the artists in this project as illustrators that were brought in to illustrate or visualize an existing testimony. So an arts-based approach, well, the art itself, the artist itself, Will be, will be used as a critical tool of inquiry. And, and Barbara describes this beautiful drawing for me is an in, in investigative tool. When I draw each stroke is a decision and every line poses new questions. How can a child be, exist in these circumstances? I'm drawing scenes in which she, Emmy, is remembering today what was happening at that time after waking up at the movies in a cafe while looking in the mirror. And so it is, as part of the research process, very important for us to keep a record of all these, these, um, these drawings, these sketches, as they, of course, changes in, in the process of the work. And here I want to show you some of her uh, incredible work. I think it's probably the most difficult work to, to draw um, imagery that are very well known through Holocaust iconography. So. Um, Barbara was, was tasked to, to go back to drawings in Ravensburg and in Bergen-Belsen 
and I think she's done an extraordinary job. And, and you can see here in the captions, she, she brings back the, the, the issues of memory recall. I don't remember when they took our father because Amy was so, was so small at the time. I remember all kinds of voices that night, all kinds of women were crying. I remember, I remember. So this whole process of remembering, again, is evoked throughout, throughout this, this narrative. And, and Amy then says, I can picture the things that happened to me, but I no longer remember exactly when and which camp they occurred. I remember hunger, cold blows. Death was very familiar to us. We encountered it every day. What I found very fascinating, what I haven't expected is that artists will ask very different questions from survivors than, than I would, a scholar. So I will be interested in dates and in, in names, but artists will ask, what did you wear? Um, what, what did the background look like? What, what did you smell? And so I think, and it's a bit of a hypothesis, as the survivors are confronted with completely different sets of questions, it recalls different memory experiences for them as well. So I think Emmy, through this process of work with, with Barbara, that was very personal, very difficult at times, very intimate, uh, also, in a way, was able to access memories. I think she would not have had um, in, a, in a more traditional setting. And this brings the question of support. Um, I think in a setting like this, it's very important to, to have counselors available, to have a, a support network, not just for the survivor, but for the artist and for the students as well, who, who have to transcribe uh, these, these d d d documents. Um, Barbara told me at one point, you know, she said, I could not possibly draw what Emmy told me. So the, this mediating effect that the artist takes, uh, this mediating effect, this filter is, is something that comes through in the graphic novel. But of course, we expose our students that, that have to read these testimonies to trauma. And so within this, this process, um, having counselors available is, is critical. And here is another uh, panel you see when Emmy remembers very little. The choice was then uh, to have a, a blank panel. Here again, um, Emmy going back to as a, memories as a small child in The Hague, and, and Barbara chooses to give an empty panel. Here are some that I, I collected, some of the drawings as, as they start evolving and, and coming to the fore. Again, this is, I would argue, this is all part of the me memory work that, that comes together in this relationship. It can't be done quickly. It, it just has been a process over a year uh, where both are, are, ve are really very deeply committed to this project and, and, and work together. Again, you can see Barbara was struggling how much you should show from Ravensbrück and, and on the left was an original, an earlier drawing. And then you can see that the, the barracks were added, um, inmates, prisoners were added, sky was added. So all of this again, art in itself struggles with, with very difficult issues of representation. And Barbara says it beautifully here, and I'm almost wrapping up. Sorry, this is taking a little bit longer. So Emmy's childhood is connected with each and every today. The past has not ended. The long arms of history wrap right around the present, across generations up to today for surviving. It's not over. Surviving is every day. She shows us very, very compellingly and very movingly in, in Emmy Arbel's story. And and but I live. Uh, somebody that reads the title might think it's it's a heroic confirmation, but it is actually not. It is Amy Arbel in the end that, that describes that that she really was um, was ready to to let go. To um, she didn't want to go on living anymore. But then she said, "I live." So. I have to live. And so even there, I think Barbara really undercuts certain expectations. In oftentimes we have a narrative from darkness to light, and this is not the case of Amy, and it's not the case of the other survivors as well. But again, as Amy says so well, the fact is, I am still alive. And so with this, I'd like to end. I have a big list of, of, of uh, bibliography if you're interested in, 
in, in books and scholarly research that deals with uh, tra traumatic history with, with graphic novels. Here are just a few that I've listed. So um, thank you. That's it. <laughs>